nerdy kid, but I was a really emotional, emotional kid. I mean, the only two people when I was young and growing up in a really, really small part of Canada, a uh, little tiny town. Uh, the only, television then was like my connection to the outside world, and the only two people I saw that I thought felt anything as big as I did were Barbara Streisand <laughs> and Steve Jobs. <laughs> Those were my two guys. They were like, they popped off the TV screen to me, both of them, because they were both really sure in their own very different ways. Barbara running for the tugboat with her hair back, and the bouffant and the Fanny Bryce thing, and singing, and Steve Jobs imploring Tom Peters how important the Macintosh was. I just knew that they really got it. And I kind of let that out in an interesting moment in my life. I was a real jock, young, and I played basketball a lot. And I went to Jewish summer camp, which is just a haven, as you know, for intense athletes. <laughs> <laughs> so much so that they asked me at, I don't know what age, 11, to run the basketball course for the girls. That's how prepared they were for intense competitive athletics. Uh, and so I got really into it, and I was going to teach everyone, and you're going to be better. And then especially when they informed us, they had the idea that the campers should play the counselors. Oh, and it was like life or death for me. This was now the most important moment of my life, and we had to win. I was very competitive. And I coached everyone the best I could, and I was mostly consistent of telling them what to do and being intense, uh, you know, like that was going to get me somewhere. And the day of the actual competition came, and I kind of lost it in the middle of the game. Uh, because, you know, just by virtue of being closer to the baskets, they were winning. That was all it really took. And at one point, the worst player on our team, Annette, who also had the misfortune of being the one Gentile person who accidentally ended up in this northern Canadian <laughs> Zionist Jewish summer camp. <laughs> and I was like, Annette, what are you doing? And I benched her. You know, I was like, oh, I'm going to have to do this all myself, play the whole game. Well, of course we lost, and then by the end of the game, the second it was over, I had like that, you know, like talker's remorse or hangover remorse. I had this feeling the next morning, like, what? not even the morning, like the second it was over, like, what did I do? Like, I'm a horrible person. I felt incredibly guilty, thereby fitting into the Jewish summer camp, <laughs> more than the basketball. And um, I just, I didn't know what to do about it. I felt really, really badly. This camp decided to have awards at the end of the summer for the first time, and they gave out an award for best athlete, best girl and boy athlete, which is not a very tough competition at Jewish Zionist summer camp. And uh, I won. It was the first trophy I ever won. And when I went up to get it, I felt really terrible, uh, and the room was really quiet. A different kind of quiet than it is now. It was a kind of, OK, what are you going to do? Like, say something. And I just, I looked at them, and I kind of sucked it up. I just wanted to get rid of this burning feeling in my face and this knot in my stomach. And I said, I'm really sorry. I'm sorry, Annette. I don't really deserve this. You tried harder than I did. And I'm not, you know, proud of the way I behaved. And I, in that moment, I could feel the entire energy of the room. I said, energy at a UX conference. I'm willing to deal with that in a moment. <laughs> but I felt the entire, if I had a better word, by the way, I would use it. Uh, but I felt the entire energy of the room completely change. It was the first experience I had of an emotional shift that I'd had something to do with that was good, not just like I lost my crap during the game and made everyone mad. It was the first time it went another way, and it was the first time I realized that you could, that it was a doable thing, and that how we feel really was underneath a lot of stuff. And that moment really stayed with me. Through many uh, years of different things, I became uh, nerdier and nerdier as the years went on. I don't know how all of you spent high school. I kind of, I didn't have the internet yet, I just had, we had books which I treated like a smartphone, pretty much. <laughs> you know, they kind of slide with your finger when you do this, and uh, they can occupy all your time. It's, you know, you can build peripheral vision using them. You can still walk with them and do all the same avoidant things you do with the phone, with the book. <laughs> if anyone wants to tell you it's the Internet's fault, 
It's not true. It's all, it's all us. So I, because, you know, I was the kind of kid who maybe didn't have the easiest time, maybe because of my outbursts when I was really young, um, I started to think about stuff. I mean, I always liked thinking about stuff, but I started to, uh, to use thinking the way people use crack. But I didn't know that that's what I was doing, and it's sort of my hypothesis that this is a nerdy thing. This is a thing a lot, I'm going to guess a lot of nerds do, not just me. I can't say for sure. You can all let me know. Yes? Who was the first? Yes. Is it, what's your name? Dan. Dan. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, when you start wondering about the lyrics of the song and what they mean more than enjoying singing the song, that's a tip-off right there that you're sort of leaving the, or in my case, I, it's because it felt so, like, so sad. Bye Bye Miss American Pie at summer camp was like breaking my heart. I didn't know, you know, the story behind it. Then of course I wanted to learn, because then I could handle the story behind it just a little bit more. So this kind of nerding out, you know, in the world that I lived in got me nothing but rewards. Nothing but what an awesome person you are. You're so reasonable. The world loves to tell you you're reasonable. That's a great thing. You know, emotional, terrible. You know, you don't want to be like a girl, especially if you're a girl. It's the worst possible thing you could do, especially if you're trying to do something in the public sphere. So, you know, I, I really learned, I learned to think so much, I ended up in law school and I didn't even mean to. <laughs> okay. I got a law degree I didn't even want to get. Accidentally, that's how much I learned how to do that stuff. In fact, I started performing in law school because I hated it so much. Couldn't quite figure out why I did. Um, and I did start to do comedy there uh, because of it. And then when I started to keep doing stand-up and doing it at South By, before, adaptive, before, you know, Adaptive Path, when it was just a bunch of cool people hanging out and there weren't little cards printed up with how much money you can make in every market across the country because the internet's the most important thing in the economy. Um, I did a joke one time at a show where I asked the audience, hey, who here has repetitive stress injury? And someone yelled, we can't raise our hands. <laughs> and I loved it so much, I thought, that is awesome. What if I didn't write all the jokes? And I only thought that because I'd been hanging out with people who I later found out would be UX nerds, you know, be like Derek, Pawasik, and Jeffine, and whoever because I learned all this stuff about community and about lots of people. What if you got a lot of people together? And I learned, I didn't know how to code, but someone explained object-oriented software to me. So I started trying to combine this idea of having more people involved. But that moment from camp stayed with me. And so along with the jokes, I really wanted everyone to feel. And what I started to learn is I tried to, to learn stuff from other people. Wow, I hope this is, it's near lunch, right? I don't mean to be Michigan. I don't know your name. What's your name? Andy. Andy. Um, do you, would you talk to me for a sec? I don't, but I don't believe in talking to anyone who doesn't want to talk to me, so it's okay. Carol, are you here with the mic? Can we get Andy the mic for a sec? <laughs> Thanks. Hey, I can see you all now. We're very stylish, incredibly thoughtful people who know what the lyrics to lots of songs mean, I'm pretty sure. Andy, <laughs> hey, can, can they hear, is the mic working? Is it working? Okay. Yeah, yeah. You're okay. from, um, oh wow, encouragement. Jesse's like, stage mom, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> are you. Are you from Michigan? Yes. Uh, where in Michigan? Uh, East Lansing, Okemos, it's in the center. Like it doesn't matter? Yeah, well, uh, I'm gonna mirror this visualization software here. Yes. Andy, okay, Lansing, at, not far from where I grew up, Niagara Falls, I'm from okay. Niagara Falls. Right. Do you still live there? Uh, yes, I do. And you work in UX and you live in Lansing, Michigan. Yeah, it's awesome. The world has completely changed. That's incredible. How did you get into, into doing this? I started my own business in college. Yeah. In college. Can you hear Andy? Okay, just because a little bit at the end, it got a little bit. No, sorry. Almost Canadian. Almost like I don't want to be too proud of what I did <laughs> by myself. So I'm just going to drop it a little bit because I did my own thing and that was, you know, by myself, I made a whole business. In college, I didn't wait to graduate or anything. <laughs> School wasn't really taking up enough of my mind. I was bored. What did, what did you study? 
Uh, media communications technologies. Technology, okay, can you even study that now? All right. Um, in Michigan? Yes, Michigan State. Michigan State, therefore the, the sweatshirt. All right. And uh, did you, were you excited about doing your own business? Or were you like, I live in Michigan, if I want to stay here, I better start my own business? No, I was excited <laughs> about it. Yeah. And how did you know? How did you know what you wanted to do? I don't know if I knew what I wanted to do. I just did it type thing. I don't know. Well, give me, like, uh, do you remember something near the start of doing it? Like, so did someone ask you to build a website, or what was one of the early things you just so-called just did? So I made Blackberry themes, and the reason I did it is because I didn't like how my Blackberry looked, so I learned Photoshop and... I'm going to fix it myself. Yes. Were you always that kind of, like... Yes. I don't like this. I'm going well, to fix it. Yeah, it didn't always work out, but I tried. How did you know you didn't... <laughs> right. But the, the I'm trying to do it feels good, right? Right. How'd you know you didn't like the Blackberry theme? The, like the current one? Yeah. I thought it was ugly. I don't know. I just didn't like how it looked. Hold on. You've got to slow it down a little bit because I'm, I'm not catching it. You, did, you thought it was ugly because? I just didn't like how it looked. I just thought it was ugly, so I thought I'd make it look better. How do you know it looked ugly for you? Know. Like how, what lets you know that? What let you know that? My brain? <laughs> <laughs> Right? Probably. The, the experience. <laughs> Question mark? Neuroscientist Heather Gold explains. Well, it's the lumbar. No. <laughs> so that gap right there, okay? That gap between, I just did this thing. I did it. Whatever. No big deal. And uh, because I didn't like it, okay. Like the why, the how, it's hard. Like, it's not obvious. Because you just know. But the how do you know? is to me really interesting and the way to dive into more, like it's in a bit of an emotional thing, I think. Mm -hmm. is, or is it a pure like, I did a scientific study and it should be, you know, a golden ratio and it's not, I mean, did you really think it through that way? No. You just kind of knew it looked like ass. Pretty much. <laughs> right. So, all right, and then when, did it work, the one you made? Did you like it better? No, it was actually worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is like where I, I sound like a therapist. How did that make you feel, Andy? <laughs> I worked harder and eventually made one that I thought looked better, so. I just kept working at it, practice. Right, and we were right back to doing a thing. Okay. Thanks, um, Carol. If you thank Andy, thanks for helping out and starting. Okay. So there's this whole world in there, and it's slow and little, and maybe when it's just my I hate the Blackberry theme, it doesn't seem like a big thing, but there's a whole process that goes into the... And it's fast. That's the amazing thing about our instinctual self. It doesn't... Um, I mean, I, I talked to you in part because it looked like maybe you were a little bit tired or I was not, you know. Okay, maybe you didn't sleep much? You were partying? No. Working on both themes. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so that, that gap, I think, is really significant. I think it's so significant that I think it's um, it, emotional stuff and, and awareness is sort of the root of it, is in my opinion, the single biggest thing missing from the entire internet and the thing that's responsible for almost all the problems in the economy and social justice, which is going to sound like a very hyperbolic thing to say. I've thought about this and felt about this for at least a decade, so I'm not saying it just off the top of my head. That kind of how I feel about something, my ability to handle feeling about something, we're generally terrible at. The culture's terrible at it. Nerds, I believe, are especially terrible at it. Maybe sometimes because we're more sensitive, not because we can't. It's not like the culture says, hey, why do you spend a lot of time having a bunch of feelings? Let's just kick out the themes and just do it. And the, the kind of how you get there isn't always other than, you know, here's how Photoshop works. Um, because when we talk, when we distance ourselves from something, whether it's analyzing the lyrics to a song or talking about a tool sometimes, even though we have feelings, because I know nerds have feelings about tools, and can very passionately tell you what's wrong with the tool and that the interface should be different, and, it's that caring that makes it interesting in the first place to me, anybody's work. The most interesting thing to me is why they care about it. Same with any talk anyone gives. And I care about this more than probably um, 
anything, because it's been the most dismissed thing, it's been the hardest thing for me to learn, and mostly unlearn. So when I started trying to this thing where I would talk with people, like Andy or try to get to know them, and slowly we only have so much time, so I can only talk to so many people, shift what happens, um, I found that I had to learn certain things to get people to, to open up and to talk to me, because my goal became the opposite of traditional stand-up, which is often everyone shut the, can I swear? You know, shut up and uh, listen to me. And also, you have to be worth listening to, right? But if I want you to talk to me, which when you guys design social spaces or you design anything that involves lots of people, that's a big part of the equation. How are we going to make it so that other people can show up? And often, people, when they pitch business plans, that's the magical step. Again, kind of like the leap, where there's a big gap. Oh, well, like we're going to build this thing. You guys are probably the people forced to do this. Hi, uh, UX designer, give me one of these things, and then we'll have a community that's really engaged. It'll just be there. Just spread some you know, magical UX peanut butter on this thing, everybody will be there. It'll be awesome. Uh, or we'll be back to pivot in six months, give me a new one, I'll blame you. Right? I mean, it doesn't just happen. It's a thing you actually do. But the way we do it is based on our own human, very emotionally sensitive skills. And I think that the most important skills to work on you know, the soft skills are the hard skills, and they're the most important skills because they're the ones the machines aren't going to do. And no matter how secure we all think our work is, um, the machines are just going to get better at doing all the other stuff that we all do. <laughs> As you know, you could be designing yourself out of a need to learn how to do design because there's going to be, you know, network computers designing certain things. So. Uh, that feeling of, of how and that ability to handle your feeling, which we're equally terrible about, is, is underneath the ability to handle people being together and being different. And we're different in bajillions of ways, but that's part of how you make a connection um, and with anybody, is, and is to not demand emotionally from the other person, and the only way you can do that, or the only way you can evoke an emotional response, which I imagine you're all asked to do all the time in your work, is by having an empathic sense of their feeling, and the only way you can really, really do that is by knowing your own. I talked to a few people in putting this together who told me, well, I'm really empathic you know, for users, but not so much for myself. You know, I'm criticizing myself at the time because my first theme looked terrible, right? It's a lot easier. That's a mental response that we then put all this emotional stuff with. Well, I suck, so I feel bad. I feel bad, so I suck. I'm not sure which is coming first. But that, I don't think, is usually super helpful. The only way to, to shift it or to know about it is, is to kind of practice. And the way I started learning was by talking to people in the so-called audience and noticing how their face looked and what their body looked like and practicing mirroring, you know, with posture, whatever anybody was doing. Um, and our faces read so much faster than emoticons, which is, by the way, where the web still's at emotionally. You guys, we haven't come up with anything since emoticons. <laughs> Wired published a piece really recently saying that the big new thing is going to be mood graphs because Facebook has a drop-down emoticon menu and Bitly's putting out a feeling thing. We're all going to know how everybody genuinely feels everywhere all the time. Now, emoticons are better than nothing, but I think we can do better than that. And the only way we're going to do better than that is if we actually think it matters, believe, feel it matters in the first place. Because you can think something matters, but you're probably not going to do anything about it to feel that it matters. Or you can, but you're kind of got to do it in this arm's length. Like, I have to do it. I have to do this thing. Here I do it. Or I'm going to analyze. Your, your left brain can work tired. The rest of you doesn't work for me so, so well in a tired way. So um, it's a hard thing to do. And the reason I think that gap is so big is because we've split sort of what is supposedly private and public apart at least the kind of culture we're a part of, where you go to work, you say important things, and everything's comprised of two big things, doing a bunch of stuff and thinking about a bunch of stuff. And you get this little tiny sliver of space for feeling, and here's when you get to feel. On your birthday, maybe you get a cake or some donuts. The day maybe everyone's laid off, there's some feelings about that. So they have security guards maybe at a big company because there'll be feelings. We won't know what to do with that. It's a company. Things could be over. Uh, when you have beers with people after work, that's my favorite one. 
how we go to work and we're sort of one person, then after all, we're going to actually really find out now who you are. Because it wasn't worth being that person all day long. It's not like we'd actually find anything out or make better creative work or anything. And the thing about it is without access to that part of ourselves, the feel, oh, and in your line of work, users, right? So-called users? They're all about feelings, right? Don't you worry about their emotions and how they felt about this thing, if they were engaged and happy? So those people over there have some feelings, not for us, I'm too smart for that. I'm productive as crap, you know? <laughs> Goddamn feelings, what is this, therapy? Matriarchal, you know, that's the other piece of it. It means, you know, supposedly weak. And the thing is, it's a complete false pretense that it's not actual people showing up at the jobs, designing the stuff, all of whom are motivated by emotion. So that's a thing I've tried to use. It's helped me as I've started doing more and more shows um, that involve more people. I did a show at Gettysburg College a couple years ago where I was asked to talk about some gay and lesbian stuff because they had problems on campus. And at that point, there was, I think, one out gay person on the campus. It's a very politics-oriented campus. It's affiliated with some president. I can't remember which one, maybe Truman. And um, so I went to a meeting of their gay-straight alliance, where they were going to talk politi politics and policy. And there were like 35 people there, and they all had good, reasoned, analytical, principled ideas. But then when I asked you know, to hang out with people in the community, well, none of them were gay. Supp supposedly, it was pretty clear to me, almost all of them were. <laughs> and I kind of promised myself, I, did my, I started my show, and I started jokes, I had Sarah Palin material, and jokes about, you know, I came out in the 80s, it was terrible because I had no one to look up to, there was no Katie Lang, no one the generous, I only had Velmon Scooby-Doo for inspiration. <laughs> So I'm doing my stuff, and then I'm just like, I'm gonna work this room. I'm just gonna work it. And I just promised myself I would not get off the stage till I did, and I got 20 students to come out in an hour. <laughs> this is social sculpting social space, and this is, in my opinion, what you guys are gonna be doing for work eventually, and why I think interaction design, once we don't have screens, and it's not all about buttons, or just about objects like the chair talks to my refrigerator, it's going to be performance and theater. You guys are going to be making a new kind of theater. That's why I've tried to keep developing interactive performance. There's a scene in Diamond Ages, someone made me read the book because I talk about this so much, and that kind of gets into some of a vision of what this could look like if you want to see a more developed idea about it. You have to make it through like 500 pages of text to get there, but it's in there. Um, but that's the thing, because interaction without stuff between people is a kind of performance where, it's, where there's conditions created, where you're trying to see, can I make something happen? Can I make something more likely to happen? And the tool, the main tool you use uh, for me is like expressiveness and stuff that's all connected to feelingness and a lot of affect. And um, we're so weak on affect online now, and I kind of always feel like I want to implore, like, you have the power. You guys are the people, or some of the top UX designers in the world, who are the people who advocate for humanness in this entire process, that could soon become less conscious, could soon become more about machines just jacking up our dopamine because we're going to constantly A-B test the hell out of, are you happy? Happy, happy? Make you more happy. Want some candy? Make you happier. Want a piece of crack? Make you happier. Have sex? Have happier. Orgasm machine, we got that now. Let's do 10 of those. I mean, it's sort of, those are sort of feelings, but they're really more avoidance of a true feeling because from my experience, and not that I'm an expert, just a little bit I've been learning, is that a real feeling only happens in the present moment. And that's why it's kind of a handy tool that helps you know when you're being like right now. Because you'll feel it and there'll be something that you can't totally explain. This probably makes it so fun, just like when you're in flow writing or drawing and you're like, oh, I didn't know that thing. So um, how I'm going to know how you feel is I got to tune into you, I got to notice I got different faces here, someone's a little bit, I'm not sure, got the beard, maybe. You're not sure, yeah, I'm not buying it, I'm tired, my arms are more comfortable this way. See, I'm not sure exactly what all those... What's your name? Carol? Uh, this guy, your hoodie? Can't, no, I got terrible eyesight. Khaled? Okay, one sec, Carol's gonna get to you with the mic. Be, can you be honest for a sec, how are you feeling? Uh, feeling honest, good. like it can be terrible. If you think, you, this is not a real conversation if you have to tell me something good, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I know I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit tired, I think. I guess. Uh, hungry, maybe. Waiting for lunch. Hungry. <laughs> okay. That's honest. Yeah, me too. Uh, but any other feeling? No. Yeah, okay. No, <laughs> no feelings. <laughs> Thanks, Khalid. Thanks, Carol. No, not hungry. Hungry. You can also, like, numb yourself to that, too, uh, I think. So uh, my hope is for people to become less uh, disconnected from our feelings. And the way I've been slowly building emotional capacity is like one, to view it, if it's something that feels weird to you as not relevant to your work, and I promise you, especially if you're trying to create any real-time social interaction, it is, because it's the way. I mean, I went to the, it's the way people are together. I went to the first, were you guys at the Exploratorium? I was at the, that first night gathering. I went there. There's a sign of like social behavior events. I took a photo. Like there was a whole exhibit on social behavior that no one was by, but they were all, we were all doing it. Because uh, I had this whole thing where I was imploring someone, uh, I think, oh, Joan? Joan? I can't remember if you're here. The, the guy's kind of Dutch. I don't know if you're still here. I was talking to, right up there. I was talking to about, right, about how we're all social and we're, we're obsessed with each other and that's all we're going to do. And yet, We've designed everything online to be about objects, including people. Treat your friend like an object, and you, because you have these two things in common, objectively, therefore you'll have feelings for each other. And uh, it's not how we relate, because if you just look how everyone was interacting there, no one was, for the most part, on any of the exhibits. There were lots of amazing objects at the exhibit is exploratory. Everyone was like hungry, Khalid, like eating, and completely with each other. Like, how, give me as much face as I can get. Like, I want to see your face. I want to know that you're listening to me. I'm going to unconsciously read 25 ways. I'm going to have a feeling like, oh, I don't really like this guy. I'm going to bore. I'm going to move on. i got to get a drink, you know. Just slowing that process down and, and feeling like what's really going on will help give you not just more capacity to handle connecting in your own life uh, or, and facilitating groups for sure, help people talk with you more, but when you're gonna be creating social systems or so-called you know, social sites or apps, to think about or to help create a space where you're first starting with how do people feel, because it's the main reason everyone's there and showing up, is we wanna feel connected to other people and, we, and our emotional feedback is a thing showing us um, that we have it. How am I, sorry, do, you know, because I'm not a, I'm not a podium person. I didn't have the, I didn't have the time. So um, I've got like enormous amounts of feelings about this, but is there, is there any specific question or specific thing you wanna make sure that I get into that you think as it relates to what you're doing that I've missed? Um, Carol, somebody right here, sorry, just so we can all hear you. Um, so if you feel something, you have that feeling. What's your name, by the way? Oh, uh, Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Hi. I like your outfit, by the way. Thank you. Master I love shoes. orange. I just like, oh, yeah. Your size is also orange. Um, anyway, so if you have that feeling, um, how do you explain it to someone who is attached so that you can get, so if you just like kind of know that something's right, how do you make sure that it gets delivered to your team? You mean, how do you get other people to understand how you feel? Yes. Yeah, so, for example, if someone asks, oh, so, because I feel like in design, a lot of what will happen is I'll say, like, I'll just know that something's right, and then someone will ask, how do you know it's right? And I'll go, oh, okay, now I had to defend why it's right, but I know it's right. Right. And mental stuff can sometimes feel, like, defensive. So you already have now a new motion, which is, oh, kind of a little tact, and kind of like I'm supposed to, right. That's the thing if people don't want to feel, which is pretty much what our culture is obsessed with, you know, give me some reality TV and some high fructose corn syrup and some, some good times. I don't feel any uh, crap I already have to feel in there. So it, that's part of the thing is always you build your emotional capacity, including, most importantly, your ability to feel uncomfortable. Like, that's the main emotional push-up, is constantly knowing that you're going to lean into the discomfort. When somebody else is uncomfortable, this is part of what's helped me with so-called audiences people, is then you start to know this is them. This is me. And you can have a kind of separation. You can watch them instead of having a, re a reaction, a stronger reaction to them. And that'll at least give you some space. And honestly, you start to have to work with um, them emotionally. So they're having an emotional reaction, whether they want, even if it's, I don't want to feel like that's stupid. 
I'm st- that's stupid. And, you know, I, I love how people are like intense and angry. And this feeling thing is stupid. I'm like, that's such an unemotional response to emotion. <laughs> you clearly don't have feelings yourself. It's always like a ranting rage of incensedness that there's no feelings in that person. Um, often just saying, like, I think you feel this way, or is this, is this how you feel about it? Like, I didn't do it super well with Khalid, but I think I tried to give you, like, I don't know how many options, with an affect that was like, I'm not sure, I'm inquiring, but I'm not tell- I'm trying to tell you that I know. Because you can't know how someone subjectively feels. I mean, the beauty of subjective feeling is that you own it, and absolutely no one else gets to take it from you, like it's yours, no matter what. No matter even if you're stuck in prison, like Chelsea Manning is, you know, it's yours. No one else gets to say, we know this thing about you better than you do. But then they, could, they might react to you that way. So um, I think it's tough to mentally sell an emotional thing. I think that's part of building the kind of capacity to handle that they, maybe they're uncomfortable and to say, well, you know, how's it that you feel about it? They might react even more upset if you're asking them to understand how they feel. Sometimes being next to somebody is helpful, like it's hard to do in this physical setup, but in a lot of situations, um, I'll do a lot of mirroring, like I said, physical things, mirroring or facial mirroring. Michelle, where you really give them like a lot of intense, like I'm totally listening to you, you give them a lot of ener- attention, focused, attentive energy, that's the kind of leaning into the discomfort. Like you, who's kind of upset with me, I'm gonna be totally so there for you right now. And they'll feel it. Even if they don't know what the hell it is, it works. It's, all, it's how I got the 20 kids to come out. I mean, it wasn't because they were all really excited to do it. I mean, once the room, once it became socially more acceptable, it dropped the amount of emotional con- capacity they needed to have to, to do it. They didn't have to be so strong on themselves because it became a, an easier kind of belonging. The more you can contain with yourself, the less you need someone else to tell you, like, yes, we all agree, because you can handle, okay, well, I don't agree with you. And you can have that, and I can have this, and we can still hang. Sitting next to someone's a good one. You probably already do that sometimes when you guys present, maybe on tablets, instead of talking like this, like a next to kind of thing. And these are Again, the energy word. These are things I've just have experienced in helping people who come up on stage with me and getting them to open up and things, and sometimes giving someone a meaningless physical task that you tell them is important, but isn't. (laughs) But they'll be sure they're accomplishing something. And it can really disarm somebody. And they can a little bit more, because once you get them into exploring mode, it guards down a little bit. So then, okay, I just know this is right, they don't. Well, how do you know? Then, see, it wasn't easy, and we don't have that much time, it's not my client, and I live, but if we went at it slowly, they might start to show you what doesn't seem right about it to them. Then you have something real to work with. Is that, I hope that's helpful. Any, uh, I think we have maybe time for one more. By the way, anybody else run bare, do this barefoot running thing? I'm really into it. Now, one, other, no, two, three, four, five. Hey, I know you. No? Yes, I don't. I'm mistaken. Everyone's got the same good looking <laughs> eyeglass. Okay, I apologize. Who I humiliated myself in front of? Blake Ramick. I thought you were my, a friend of mine, Josh, from Brooklyn, but I'm wrong, Blake. Hi. No. In answering uh, her question, you said. Uh, and you are? In answering her question. Oh. Your name? I'm hidden. Ila- Ila- Iliana. Iliana. In answering the, uh, the just this last question, you said that sometimes you'll mirror the person's yeah. body language, and versus doing the opposite thing, like being very open and welcoming to someone who's crossed. Mm-hmm. But when you do mirror and do exactly what they're doing, sometimes what is, what is that? So is that to get them to see how they're behaving, or, or what's, what's just, your? It's goal a thing I've that? played with, kind of like I learned from my web friends. Like I iteratively try different things, so I'm just sharing things that like I tried a bunch of times, and things have worked over time. Um, I found because it's more, I'm trying to work more on a level of um, how it feels, which is not a thing you, like I thought about. Um, so that sense of like I'm with you, this person's with you, which is, which is for me a much bigger thing about when I say like this is the, the root of the big problem, this being able to be different together is really key to being with each other. And when corporations and our business models are so afraid of feeling, we're not seeing what's probably motivating all our decisions anyway, which is 
most of our presumptions are sort of emotionally focused, and that kind of with-relatedness is very different than I'm getting you to do something. So when someone tells you in a business model or a design, you're going to get them to do such and such, you're going to get them to be passionate, you're going to get them to whatever, you can invite and create conditions, but if you want it to be really relational, you have to be with them, and that's the same level thing, and that's a, and a bit of an emotional, like, it's, it, I guess the other thing I do is I, I kind of place a feeling in myself that I hope they'll feel. The same way that if you know if someone's listening to you, know if they're like, I could give a crap what you're saying, or they're like, yeah, I really care. And I can't say I know, maybe someone here knows the neurobiology of how that works. Like, we're kind of amazing, we just know. We know this person cares, we know this person really doesn't care. So some of it's practicing having that feeling, giving it to myself, and hoping they can feel it. Thank you. No, thanks. Ileana. So uh, the thing I wanted to add about the barefoot running is maybe my friend up there with that, no? Uh, you got a question? Is, I mean, the idea behind these, as I understand it, is that you can feel more, like the ground, so your foot can sense balance. And uh, it's the same kind of thing. It's like with emotion, it's to get closer to the ground of how, what we're already taking in and not, like not becoming more emotional aware is like walking around on the big boots with big thick soles because kind of protects us and distances us, like analyzing the song lyrics. Do we have time, Jesse, for one more person? Are we going to wrap it up? Can, Carol, would you visit our uh, gentleman with the hat? We'll have a name in a second. Would you tell me your names? Hi, my name is Paul. Hey, Paul. Um, we played the numbers game. Um, I was just learning uh, about willing blindfoldness. And Will, will, willful, willful blind. Willful blindness. Right. Yes, you said it better. <laughs> and uh, so there's lots of social issues that are hard to bring up with people because they don't, they won't accept it. And so right. that's a very difficult thing. And being a veteran, one of those is a military for me. So um, I'm curious, like how I can share my feelings better, so I don't, you know, impose something that's difficult for many people. Um, you're saying it can be difficult. Let me do it. Let me see if I understand your question. Is it that if I, you really talk about your feelings about your service in the military? Right. Like if there's something that, if there's a feeling that is a barrier. Right. Right. And so if, if you want to be more cognizant of your feelings, but there's like a heavy, complex social component to it that people don't really want to be aware of, right? They, they kind of know it's there, right? But they don't, it's hard to discuss. Right, so if we are going to be talking about being open with our feelings, like how can we make that a little easier for people? Well, I mean, you have to start with yourself. That's the point for me of the irony of like, you know, people say that cobbler's kids have no shoes. Like, we know everything, nerds, but do we know, you know, us? I know all my users and I really care about them. I mean, I think you have to, I mean, learning in community, and I, I, if you've served, I mean, you certainly have difficult, there's no way to do that and not have difficult emotional stuff to talk about or to deal with or to process. Sometimes physically is really helpful too. Like there's somatic kind of therapy. I'm a big fan of therapeutic stuff for people, but just like with talking in this, only if you want to. I don't think, I think it's pretty hard to make anybody do anything. So, I mean, you can start with people who already identify themselves, Paul, who already say they want to talk about that stuff, or you know it's okay with them. Um, and then the other thing is, I think as you become more, or I found, the more tuned in I am to how I feel, the better my sensors are about, can this person handle it? Are they in a place where they can go there for this with me? And then I can do a better choice. Okay, this, this person's already, their capacity's a little bit bigger. This person's kind of only here. I can go this far. I can go kind of farther. But my feeling is kind of like with the peer-to-peer -peer networking thing, like if we do it, you guys have a huge, I mean, I, I believe this will be a really key skill for the work you're going to do, especially post, you know, button design screen time. I think it'll, I think it spreads to other people you're around because the more you can contain and handle your own emotion, the less you're asking of anybody else emotionally. The more you're like, when someone else has their own response, the less personally you take it because you're like, oh, because I know what that is, and I, or you just know I feel scared because they're freaking out at me. But at least you can, you know, do your emotional push up and like work with it and be like, okay, I'm scared. I mean, maybe this person over here is okay to talk to about it. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like one of the things about say coming out or coming back from services, I mean, I, I don't know what the VA offers, but like to at least start with people who are where you are so that you can, I mean, the same way you guys would 
tonight talk about what it's like to do with your clients, because you all have that in common, and you know maybe what that dynamic's like, and these people really get it, whereas when I have to go back and tell someone else who's in my situation, it's, it's got a lot more explanation I've got to do. So, okay. I don't want to keep anybody from having food. That would be terrible and un-Jewish of me. So uh, I want to thank you all for being here. I really enjoy you next week. Go change everything. Thank you.